Hi, we're at the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association International Conference. I'm here with Dr. Libby Grubbs and Dr. Mimi Hu. Dr. Grubbs and Dr. Hu, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting us. So can I just start off by asking you both to introduce yourselves for our viewers? So my name is Libby Grubbs. I am a surgical oncologist that uh, works at MD Anderson uh, in, in Houston. Um, and I specialize from a clinical standpoint in um, endocrine neoplasia, including medullary thyroid cancer, uh, and have a research interest also in um, hereditary diseases and specifically medullary thyroid cancer. Great, thank you. My name is Mimi Hu. I'm an associate professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I am an oncologic endocrinologist. Uh, my particular area of interest is thyroid cancer, especially medullary thyroid cancer and multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, as well as bone health in our cancer population. So let's talk about medullary thyroid cancer. What is it and how is it different than other thyroid cancers? Well, medullary uh, thyroid cancer, you can think of it um, with the idea that whereas most of the thyroid is made up of follicular cells, about two to three percent of the thyroid is made up of parafollicular cells, and parafollicular cells are the cells that make, that cause medullary thyroid cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer makes up about one to two percent of all thyroid cancers. So it's a rare thyroid cancer. Um, when you hear about thyroid cancer, it's usually not medullary, but the, the well-differentiated uh, thyroid cancers. So because medullary thyroid cancer is so rare, is it more serious or more difficult to treat? That's a great question. Not necessarily, um, but it is true that with medullary thyroid cancer, the experience level of other physicians in the community or even in academic centers, they may not have the experience level with managing this uh, type of thyroid cancer as the more common type like papillary or follicular thyroid cancer. And um, I think understanding that the rarity of disease is such that it's important to seek care at a center that is a high referral center for this type of disease so that you get the best multidisciplinary care for it. If you've been diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer, what can you expect in terms of treatment? Well, first of all, it, if we can make the diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer before we consider any type of surgery, say you have a thyroid nodule, um, it is better to know that the diagnosis before we, we, we operate uh, because that allows us to really plan the appropriate surgery for a patient that has medullary thyroid cancer, which may be different than someone going to surgery for a papillary thyroid cancer or a thyroid nodule when you just don't know what the diagnosis is. So starting out, because surgery is one of the first lines of therapy, um, we really want to take care that if we can make a diagnosis of the disease prior, and usually that's by a fine needle um, aspirate biopsy, um, then that helps us then be able to prepare the right operation. And I have to add to that is, um, knowing if this is a medullary thyroid cancer, one of their very interesting nuances about this disease is that in about 25% of patients, they could have an underlying hereditary mutation of a gene called RET, R-E-T, RET. And for that reason, it's important to, if you know that they have a medullary thyroid cancer, that they undergo genetic counseling and have blood testing for that mutation because of that one in four chance of having this mutation. If they do have this mutation, then they have the risk of the other endocrine tumors, such as primary hyperparathyroidism due to parathyroid enlargement, um, or even the uh, other tumor, which is pheochromocytoma, which is a tumor of the adrenal gland that overproduces adrenaline hormones. And understanding the risk of having either of those uh, tumors is very important prior to undergoing a thyroid surgery because we want to make sure that patients don't have any untoward toward events intraoperatively with high blood pressure issues, or also from a surgical perspective, I know Libby uh, is often uh, talking about this, is um, knowing where those parathyroids are, knowing if they are at risk for having tumor development so that um, you just go in to the situation of surgery uh, knowing all information. And, and I will say um, to, to what Mimi says, um, genetic testing for all patients that have MTC mm -hmm. is essential. 
Um, I have a lot of patients that come in and say, oh, but Dr. Grubbs, I have no family history of this. I've never heard of medullary thyroid cancer. There's no way that this can be hereditary. Uh, and actually up to 7% of patients with sporadic disease will actually have a hereditary um, cause of it and not know it. And so that testing is essential. Very important with this and what we really stress is that that genetic testing should happen in um, in the context of genetic counseling. Someone who understands w the, um, what, what the test is, what it could mean for the patient, what the different findings of the test could show, because sometimes, um, especially as we continue to, to do more and more um, from a, a technology standpoint as far as our ability to, um, to evaluate uh, and find mutations, um, it's not always clear cut. And so you really want to do this in the context of being able to be counseled by someone who understands and can help you interpret those results. Is the genetic testing just for the patient that's been diagnosed or is it for the whole family? Well, what we always recommend is for the, what we call the index case, the first patient uh, or the first member of the family who has a diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer, that they certainly get the testing done. If the test is positive, then you start testing the first degree relatives. So not necessarily jumping over to uh, grandma per se, but actually then identifying, well, um, are, uh, do you have children? And so uh, testing the children at the appropriate time frame, but also if one of, uh, testing one of their parents and they have siblings, so that's, it's when the test is positive that you start testing the other first degree relatives. So let's jump forward a little bit. After the surgery, what can a patient expect? And can you speak to quality of life issues? So, you know, obviously after um, thyroid surgery, um, without a thyroid, we, it's, it, it, you, you just can't have um, a long-term survival. It's a very important gland with producing hormones that's important for our energy level, our weight, our temperature regulation, our breathing pattern, our heart rate control. And so patients will need to be dependent upon thyroid medication for the rest of their life. And we have many patients who are on it and they do just fine. The majority of our patients do. Now there are a subpopulation of patients who don't seem to feel like their normal self again after thyroidectomy, regardless of what their thyroid hormone levels look like. And uh, that's a real tough situation uh, for all of us. Uh, we counsel our patients on um, and ensuring that their dose of thyroid medicine is appropriate with checking their labs, but if they're still having struggles with either mental fogginess or fatigue or uh, weight management problems, then we might consider uh, other modalities to help, maybe a combination with something like a T3, um, a liothyronine, or um, counseling them on dietary and uh, exercise regimens. Great, thank you. I think uh, w another thing that we talk to patients, certainly before surgery and then after as well, is um, there's going to be lifelong follow-up. It isn't going, there's never going to be a time where we're going to say, congratulations, you're done, hand you the certificate, and we can ring a bell and it's over. Right. And I think having that discussion early and often and reminding patients that we're in this together for the long term. Um, and that there's always going to be maintenance, whether it is an ultrasound of the neck alone, as well as some blood tests to evaluate for uh, calcitonin and CEA, or more than that, um, it's important that you that you you ex we we accept that and we make that part of of your your care. Thank you for addressing that. I think you really touched on some issues that many of us experience, including the quality of life issues that happen after life without a thyroid. I mean, with medullary thyroid cancer, I think one of the unique aspects is that um, it is a disease that we consider a chronic disease. Even though tumor markers may be undetectable, there is always that chance that there is a recurrence, whether it's one year, three years, five years, 10 years down the line. So long-term surveillance is absolutely essential. And um, we understand that that can be very um, nerve-wracking for our patients, um, anxiety-ridden. Uh, uh, Each visit is uh, going to increase their blood pressure because they're coming to see us and know, find out about their results. But it is, I, I tell my patients that this is not a sprint to the finish, this is a marathon. So don't expend all your energy 
at the very front end or you're going to burn yourself out. And so really uh, planting that seed at the beginning is important. So one last question. For someone who's just been diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer, what are maybe the top three things that they should know or perhaps ask their doctor? I think just to, again, stress what Mimi just said, this is a chronic disease. This is a disease that we live with for our life, but we live with it. And, I, and understanding that um, working with a healthcare team that can help you with that, the day-to-day -day and then the year-to-year -year and then the decade-to-decade, -decade, that it is a journey together and it, it is part of, of who you are, but it does not by any means define who you are. Uh, a second uh, aspect of medullary is to know whether you've had your genetic test uh, done or not. And if you did get the test done, know your results. And if it is positive, actually know what type of mutation you had because that can be predictive of behavior. So the second point is the genetic test. And then the third one is because of the chronicity is really a lot of times our patients, uh, because of the chronicity and the rarity, a lot of times our patients have to be the, um, the leader in their treatment plan. And they sometimes know more than their provider might know. And so have a log of all their uh, test results and their calcitonin CA trends so that they can, if they see a new doctor, they can actually dive, uh, give that information to the new doctor. And I think to, to add on to that, the rarity of this disease is what we find with patients um, when they get to, to a center where um, we're familiar with it. I think there's sometimes frustration before you get to that point. And so um, where they feel like they are the person explaining um, to their physician about this disease. So being able to, to find and be treated in a center where there's experience with, um, with medullary thyroid cancer, either the sporadic form or, or certainly the, the hereditary form, um, is ideal if it's possible, um, for sure. Absolutely. That this is such important and helpful information. Thank you so much, Dr. Hu and Dr. Grubbs. Thank you so Thanks. much for inviting us. Thanks.